natural gas extraction sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County and the University of Scranton's Task Force on Sustainability. My name is Bonnie Oldham. Before I introduce the speakers, let me take a moment to let you know why the League organized this event. From time to time, the League selects issues to study because they think the voice of the League could be useful as the different branches of government develop policies about that issue. At the League's State Convention in 2009, the delegates selected Marcellus Shale Natural Gas Extraction as an issue to study further. Therefore, the Lackawanna League organized this forum in cooperation with the University of Scranton in order to educate both our League members and the community about the issue of natural gas extraction. Each of our presenters will speak for 15 minutes, followed by a moderated discussion. We will conclude with a question and, and, and answer period. Index cards were distributed as you entered the ent auditorium. If you have a question, please write it on the index card. Cards will be collected and given to the moderator who will ask the questions as time allows. The forum will conclude at 9 p.m., even if all of the questions haven't been answered. Um, I ask that if you have a cell phone, please take it out now and set it to either vibrate or turn it on off so as not to disturb the presenters. Tonight we have two speakers representing the Marcellus Shale industry. Wendy Stratman is president of XOPA <laughs> and Matt Shepard is Senior Director of Corporate Development and Government Affairs for Chesapeake Energy Corporation. Pam Fendrock represents Penn Future, a membership-driven public interest organization that enforces environmental laws. Penn Future also advocates for the transformation of public policy, public opinion, and the marketplace to restore and protect Pennsylvania's environment and safeguard public health. Originally from Carbondale, Pam graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and worked in a number of fields, including print and television news, in numerous places before returning to northeastern Pennsylvania in 2002. Pam works on many issues with Penn Future, but perhaps because of her roots in the anthracite region, she has a particular interest in Pennsylvania's natural gas boom. Pat Carrillo has been a community organizer and environmental activist for four decades. He is a working communications professional and video artist. Pat is co-founder of DamascusCitizens.org, a grassroots 5013C not-for-profit organization. Since 2001, Pat and his wife have lived in the Upper Delaware River. He also founded UDPC.net and was successful in leading an effort to protect the Upper Delaware River from the construction of the massive NYRI power line. Um, the missing speaker this evening is Jennifer Means. Um, I don't know what happened to her. Uh, we invited her. She is the representative that we invited from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so, you know, I, I really haven't heard from her, but if she should, should come before, you know, her turn comes along, then we'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, put her, uh, let her, allow her to speak. Um, and then the moderator for this evening's forum, Terry Ohms, is the executive director of the Institute for Public Policy and Ac Economic Development, a think tank that provides essential research analysis and consultation to cities, counties, nonprofits, school districts, institutions, and businesses. The principal purpose of the Institute is to increase the capacity of organizations to solve their own problems and become thriving and sustaining entities with the ultimate goal of creating a better quality of life and standard of living for the community. Currently, the Institute is working on its first statewide, statewide initiative focusing on the Marcellus Shale play. Ms. Ohms has served as an Associate Research Fellow with the Pennsylvania State Legislature Office of Research since 2006. She is a cum laude graduate of the University of Scranton with a BS in Public Administration and an MBA in Finance. Please welcome all of our panelists. Thank you, Bonnie. This is an incredible opportunity that we all have before us tonight, uh, not only with the cadre of speakers that we have, but the topic that we have for discussion. Um, and in preparation for tonight's event, I Googled how to be an effective moderator. 
And uh, no matter what I Googled, I got this list of 10 rules to follow with everything from being respectful of the audience's time to reminding the moderator that they're not a panelist so they shouldn't speak forever uh, and directing the discussion and controlling the environment. Words I like, but for those of you who know me, and I, I know several of you in the audience from different capacities, 10 rules for me are way too many. So tonight I'm going to be exercising some judgment, and you as audience members get to exercise judgment as well. Um, despite the cadre of speakers up here, you're not going to walk away with a full understanding of Marcella Shale and natural gas drilling. Uh, it is far too complex a topic to fully understand uh, all of the opportunities, the limitations, uh, the impact and any risks associated with it. So I encourage you that use tonight as an intro session, if you will, and continue to do research and read and learn. And understand that this is a very passionate topic. And you and your neighbor may not agree. Your neighbor may choose to lease their land, and what you're used to seeing out of your kitchen window is forests and trees. You might suddenly see a rig, and that may be a problem. Um, others may feel the benefit of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania being a global player in the energy industry is definitely a goal that we need to work towards and Pennsylvania's political stance in U.S. politics. Those could be the, the, the drivers for other folks advocating on behalf of, of aggressive uh, natural gas industry development in the Commonwealth. But whatever your position may be, as I said, you must exercise your judgment tonight in understanding that you're going to walk away with just a snippet of information. And you're best served by continuing to read and to research and to discuss and talk with the experts. And with that, I'm sure I used more of the time that I allowed me in the 10 rules for being an effective moderator. So at this point, I'm just going to turn the program over to our speakers. And uh, Wendy and Matt. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, enjoy the opportunity to get to uh, speak. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Um, I'm uh, a member, or my company is Exco Resources. We're a member of the uh, Marcellus Shell Coalition, which is a, a group of companies that have uh, kind of joined together uh, to, you know, help. Uh, educate the public, answer questions, and that sort of thing on what is going on with the Marcella Shell. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, I'm native, uh, Washington County. I spent most of my time there in a very rural area. I used to uh, go coal picking, so to speak, uh, with my neighbors uh, at the slag dumps uh, so that everybody would have uh, some coal for the winter time. And so I'm very familiar with uh, a lot of the energy development that has gone on in Pennsylvania um, from, the, from the coal side and, and uh, the uh, steel mill industry as well from being close to Pittsburgh. Um, then uh, my family moved to uh, Indiana County, so I finished high school there and um, again in a very, very small rural area, uh, Connemaw Township to be exact, and I uh, went to Salzburg High School. After that, I uh, went to Indiana University of PA and I got a bachelor's degree in geology. Um, after that, I left. I, I got a master's degree at the University of Missouri in, in Columbia, Missouri, um, but I couldn't come back to Pennsylvania because there were no jobs. And uh, so I spent my career up until just recently out in uh, Texas and Oklahoma in the uh, oil and natural gas industry. It wasn't certainly by design, uh, but that's, that's where I could find a job, and I, I really have enjoyed it. Um, it's a very fascinating industry. It's very technical. Um, and, it, you know, it does uh, have a large impact of, with, with our nation as far as, you know, the energy industry and, and, and how we're moving forward. So, uh, but recently with the Marcella Shell uh, discovery, I was able to come back to uh, Pennsylvania and uh, work here, grow up again, have my kids grow up here. Um, and uh, it's good to be home. It's a, it's a good place to be, and I'm really excited to... Um, bring a lot of former Pennsylvania residents back home again to, to join my company and, uh, and work in this industry and then also hire a lot of local people to uh, participate in this industry. So, 
So with that, uh, the Marcella Shale Coalition, their commitment to uh, Pennsylvania is the long-term development of the Marcella Shale. And it is very vast, and it will take uh, many, many years to develop. Um, but uh, everybody is very committed to doing that and to do it very responsibly and use the water resources that are here responsibly. Um, we are uh, always investigating advanced uh, water treatment technologies. We are very interested in protecting the environment. We live here too. We employ lots of folks here. Uh, currently, uh, speak for my company, we do employ over 170 uh, folks in Pennsylvania right now, um, all, all across Pennsylvania. So. Um, we do work very hard to resolve landowner, government, public concerns, um, and we see this as a big benefit to, to the future of Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania does have a very long oil and gas well history. Um, as many, many of you probably already know that oil, uh, the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania, the Drake well, over 150 years ago. And um, so there's been, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, something over 300,000 oil and gas wells drilled in Pennsylvania, but there's 100,000 that have been producing. That's an awful lot of wells. Um, it's been going on for a very long time. Uh, fracking has been uh, introduced in the 1940s and was, have been, has been used uh, very regularly since the 1950s. It's, it's not a new practice. Uh, so uh, anyway, you can see that there, there is this long history um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this slide shows the extensive uh, nature of where the Marcella Shell can be found uh, from New York through uh, a large portion of Pennsylvania down into West Virginia and, and somewhat into Ohio. Uh, so that, that shell layer is, is very broad, extensive. Uh, so it, it covers a, a, this, this large area, and so it's kind of hard to uh, say that it's not going to produce the same in every area, uh, as you can see. So. Um, so there's lots of questions and lots of issues ac across it. And it's, again, you just have to emphasize that every area is not going to be the same. Every well produces something different. So why the Marcella shell now when it's been there for 350 million years? Uh, well, we've known about this shell as far as an industry for, for a very long time. But uh, now it's very um, economically feasible to extract the natural gas from that layer. Horizontal drilling, uh, while it's a new technology to Pennsylvania and uh, West Virginia, New York, uh, it's been around the industry for well more than 20 years now. So again, for, for those of us that have been in the industry for a long time, it isn't anything new. Uh, it's been used all over the world. Um, and the Marcella Shell, frankly, is very um, close to the Northeast Population Center uh, that has heavy use of natural gas. Um, and again, the uh, energy cost trends uh, point to natural gas as well. And then um, in the Marcella Shell, you know, there's estimates of that there's more than 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in that shell formation, and that's, that's quite a lot. So horizontal drilling, what, okay, what is it? Um, you can see on this uh, diagram, there's, there's a surface location um, at the top uh, left there for you. And um, you know, it's, it's operation that, yes, we do uh, have to have a, a drilling pad that may take up you know, five acres. And, um, but we can drill several wells from that pad and uh, not disturb uh, acreage elsewhere. So we drill down um, in the Marcella Shell about a mile, and then we uh, turn the drill bit and go sideways with it. Um, and in that, in that manner, um, we can then extract uh, natural gas under properties and um, you know, our leases. And we do what's called fracturing, which uh, many of you have heard of, but um, it's, a, it's complex, and it's to understand what exactly happens, we put several cases of drill string in to protect the water table. Again, we drill down, we put in another final string in. Uh, we perforate that final string of uh, steel casing way down very, very deep where there is no fresh water. Um, and uh, when we run the frack, uh, fracking material down into the well, it goes out those perforations that we've created and into that, that rock to create fractures, fracturing is. 
And then the natural gas there ha now has a pathway to get to the well bore, and then we can produce that natural gas. So where we are now, um, there has been a large amount of acreage uh, that has been leased in the state. Uh, again, the, most of these leases, any, they go from anywhere from some five years to ten years. And so there's, there's a time clock click, uh, clicking, ticking, excuse me, on those leases. So uh, that just means we need to get to them and, uh, uh, and get that natural gas out. Um, so because of that time clock that we're under, you can see it, an increased uh, drilling activity, okay? Um, and then um, when we get to the rig trends, this is where Matt will take over, but uh, the rig uh, trend does uh, favor Pennsylvania uh, for, for a number of reasons, but a lot of it has to do with the leases that we have, and um, a lot of them are brand new. Again, there's this time clock cl clicking uh, on it, and if we don't get to it, it, it goes away. Our investment goes away, and so... Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we can uh, act on that investment. Uh, so, for instance, Oklahoma, Texas, and such, where uh, leasing has been done for long for long periods of time, those they're already held by production. There isn't that time clock, and so you may not have drilling in those areas as active as you may have in Pennsylvania. That's just one reason. Uh, and so far, our early production reports on the Marcella Shell and, and different areas have been uh, favorable. Uh, industry is uh, excited. There's still a long way to go to understand exactly what we can produce from the shell, but uh, that's something that uh, we're all working very hard to uh, to get to those answers. So with that, uh, Matt will uh, take over. Actually, I want to tell you guys, first of all, thank you everybody for giving us the opportunity to come here and this dialogue is critically <coughs> important as we move forward to uh, five minutes. Thank you to uh, cultivate the natural resource and bring more natural gas uh, to Americans. But I do want to point out that over here, Wendy uh, referenced the casing that we put into the well. And you can come up, you can touch this. I don't know, Brian, maybe he wants to step up and put it on the table to see what it is. But we have three layers that go in. The layer he's putting up now is uh, the production casing lines the entire uh, well. Uh, and then we have other uh, layers of casing here. And it's, it's all together, so once we go through the surface casing, which you're seeing right there, the cement is pumped up. But I, I encourage you at some point to come up, um, not while I'm speaking, no, any time afterward, and, uh, and pick it up and just feel it, and so it gives you a better feel for it. So with that said, I better continue on. Uh, Pennsylvania has seen a lot of activity. However, uh, the, the rest of the country has seen a decrease in drilling rigs. That started to even out a little bit. But what you'll notice about drilling is that it doesn't all happen at once. You don't have all of the rigs in one area at one time. Uh, I was in Bradford County uh, with Brian, and there are 14 drilling rigs running there, and you still are somewhat hard-pressed to come up on one and, and find it if you're not looking for it. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you hear about uh, the number of drilling rigs a certain area or a state has. Because the Marcellus Shale is so big, those rigs tend to be spread out a little bit. Uh, want to talk a little bit about water usage and water management and because there is a lot written a lot talked about here and I think everything has to be uh, put into context and, and have some perspective but there are strict water withdrawal uh, regulations there's what you call uh, Q710 requirements which is the the lowest average seven day flow uh, that would occur with a frequency interval of once in ten years that we abide by SRBC and DRBC approvals I'm sure if you're here tonight you've heard those acronyms and understand the role they play in, uh, in water for the natural gas industry. Um, there's a significant water recycling effort uh, undergoing by the industry. A year ago, you probably didn't hear too much about water recycling or water reuse. But it's very hard to take a snapshot of this industry in the Marcellus and say, Here, here's how it is on January 20th, 2010, and here's how it's going to be a year from now, because things evolve and technology increases because there's an opportunity here and people recognize that. I do want to point out just again a little bit of perspective on the water use uh, power. First of all, producing energy does take water and there's a lot of water that is used and you never want to minimize uh, the use of a natural resource. But just to give you a perspective here, this is in millions of gallons per day. The power generation uses a lot of energy, 5.93 billion gallons per day. Industrial use is next, then public water systems and at the very end you can see at about 30 million gallons per day is Marcellus Shale uh, drilling. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands that it does take water. Uh, you don't want to minimize it, but that's a lot of things take a lot of water. 
uh, and again, this kind of talks about you can't take um, just a look and say it's always going to be this way or there's nothing that's going to change. Uh, the treatment capacity right now is certainly adequate to meet the current needs, but there are new and advanced treatment plans proposed and needed for the future. And then you're also going to have, again, a combination of technologies that do arrive as this industry develops throughout the years. And you're seeing, you know, you have the option of an injection well, which puts the uh, any uh, produced water back to where it was uh, deep under the surface, crystallization, advanced oxidation, membrane filtration and development, all of those things are, uh, are working. Another key issue, and I know I'm getting low on time, is of course hydraulic fracturing. And uh, the water used for hydraulic fracturing is water mixed with sand and chemicals. And I do want to make sure that you guys can see the, the chemical list because a lot has been written and talked about when it comes to the chemicals that are in use. And First of all, we brought some fact sheets tonight. You're more than welcome uh, to grab them on your way out. I think they're on the tables outside, detailing what is used in your typical frack job. And this is on our website. It's on uh, several different websites. You can go on and you can look at it. Important to understand that every chemical that is used in the hydraulic fracturing uh, process is used for a reason. There's something that chemical is doing in there, whether it be the hydrochloric acid, uh, which is uh, dissolving the minerals and helping to initiate the cracks. You can find it in other household uses, and that's all broken down on here for you. Uh, different things to stop bacteria from growing in the well bore to maintain the um, integrity of the well as that completion process is going on. So every chemical has a use, and it is designed to make sure that the well can be safely hydraulically fractured. And the hydraulic fracturing is the component that allows natural gas development to, uh, to occur. And just this past week, the Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, talked about the natural gas um, fines across the country from deep shale gas. And he was quick to say that he thinks it's going to be done safely. It's done very deep underground. And that natural gas is going to continue to play a very key role for America moving forward because it is a clean burning fuel. Uh, some local issues that we do want to work on, and we believe it is our, uh, our duty as an industry and as individual companies that when we do go into a community, you need to work closely with that community on the issues that are going to affect people. And a lot of that is uh, what we call road use agreements. I know as a company for Chesapeake, I can talk about what we had. Um, is that, do I have one minute or am I done? I need to wrap it up. Uh, we try and work with every community to make sure that we um, are able to get some road use agreements, make sure there's an understanding with the community, the work we're going to do before and after. And I will just tell you that um, there are a lot of jobs, the Penn State study, uh, 107,000 jobs in 2010 up to 174,000 in 2020. So that's it, and I'm sure there will be some questions for the panel. So thank you very much for your time. Matt and Wendy, thank you. Uh, I think I warned you in advance that tonight was going to be pretty heavy with information, but certainly you couldn't walk away knowing everything. I mean, just the science behind this alone is absolutely phenomenal. Um, Next, Pam Fendrock, representing Penn Futures. Pam? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, if this advances the way I hope it does, by the way, it, I won't necessarily talk to the slides, so if, like my husband, you like to tune me out at some point, just read the slides and you'll get information. So I give you options. Um, as Terry mentioned, I work with Penn Future. I've been with Penn Future for about two and a half years. Penn Future is about an almost 12-year-old organization that's headquartered in Harrisburg. We have offices in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Westchester, Doylestown, and our newest office is in Wilkes-Barre. Um, when I started with Penn Future two and a half years ago, I started as a part-time person. I was the first on-the-ground presence in northeastern Pennsylvania for Penn Future. And we started out of a spare bedroom in my house. We are now up to two full-time people in an office on Public Square in Wilkes-Barre, and my coworker Joy is sitting down here. So if you don't like what I'm saying, please don't take it out on her. Um, we, even though I'm newly on the ground and Joy's newly on the ground in northeastern Pennsylvania, our law staff 
has been working in northeastern Pennsylvania and doing pro bono work for almost as long as we've been in existence. We do, there are some people in the audience who are familiar with our work. We've worked on stormwater runoff issues. We've worked to protect streams, and, and that's the kind of work we do. Um, I am from Carbondale. I've been in and out of northeastern Pennsylvania for the better part of the last 25 years. Something keeps bringing me back. This is home. And when I came back and I had the opportunity to work with Penn Future, uh, I jumped at it. I was intimidated by the work because it's so important and there's so much I don't know and I will never know, but it's important to protect this area. Um, Penn Future I mean, Penn Future believes the same thing, and that's why I love working with the organization. That being said, why Marcellus Shale and drilling in general? We've worked for years on air, water, mining, uh, health, all, all sorts of issues, and our, we're, we're kind of a mainstream organization. We're not a strict environmental organization by some definitions because we, we know that we have to protect our environment. We have to keep our environment clean, in order to sustain ourselves, our environment, our economy. If we run down our resources and we have nothing left, then what are we going to do for jobs? What are, we have to make the two work together. So we work for practical solutions that marry the two. Now, Marcellus drilling, as, as was mentioned earlier, drilling, mining has a long history in Pennsylvania. We in the Anthracite region know better than most about that history. We essentially literally and figuratively fueled the Industrial Revolution that changed the world, the entire world. However, now we still have the scars of that. Most of the money has run out. Many of the companies are now defunct. But we have rivers that run with orange water. We have calm banks, slag heaps. You know, they're, they're called different things in different parts of the state. And there's no money. There's nothing to clean that up. Do we want to make the same mistakes again? I don't think we should. I think that if we didn't learn our lesson the first time, then shame on us if we do it again. That's not to say that we're against drilling or we shouldn't drill for gas. The point is we have to be smart about what we do. There are a lot of bad things that can come with drilling and if it's not done responsibly. I mean, let's face it, no matter what we do, if we extract a resource from under the earth, there are going to be environmental impacts. And, and anyone who says that's not true is just not really facing the facts. The point is, we have to get in front of it and we have to be smart about it. Uh, there are, as has been talked about, and I'm sure will be talked about some more, there are issues with the chemicals used in the fracking fluids. Um, frankly though, when, when water supplies have been contaminated, when there have been issues, it's not so much from the water that's going under the ground, it's from chemical spills that happen during the process. It's happened because for one reason or another, something has happened with the casing, and the casing leaks or cracks or that kind of thing. These are in many cases operational issues that can be fixed. So there, there are other issues, however. When we think about drilling, it's not just about that water, and that's a big issue. How much water is used is an issue, how it's used, how we treat it. There are companies like Range Resources is now saying they are recycling 100% of the flow back water. That's the water that comes back after a, a well is, is fracked. That's what comes back. They're recycling 100% is what they're saying, and they are reusing it. So you, that takes, they say for one well, that takes about 7,500 trucks off of the road, those trucks that don't have to take that water to some treatment plant. Because meanwhile, where do you treat that water? You can't take it to a local municipal plant. They are not set up to treat the kind of, not only chemicals, but the salt that comes back out of the earth when you take this water out. They're not set up to adequately treat it. So what do you do? You truck it somewhere. There's talk that some uh, drillers in New York State are bringing it down into Pennsylvania for treatment because I was at a conference just a few months ago. Some drillers there are talking about their trucking their water down to the Chesapeake Bay region because if, you, you, because if the water is still briny, still contains salt after you treat it, but you dump it into an area that's already salt water as opposed to higher in Pennsylvania where you have fresh water, well, maybe there's not as much of an issue. However, there are already impacts with the Chesapeake Bay. 
There, and you, some of you have probably heard about it. We're trying to clean up our sewer systems and so on because we're feeding into the rivers that feed into the bay and the bay is unhealthy. There are issues because warmer water is going into the bay, it's drawing more salt water into the bay and displacing the fresh water and that's harming the ecosystem. So I raise the, the point, if we dump more salt water at the mouth of the bay, doesn't that compound that problem? See, all of these things that don't necessarily seem connected, when you really look at them, they start coming together and they're connected. Now, there is good that can come from drilling in this state. There are people in many of the regions of this state where the drilling is really important and is really going on earnestly and will continue earnestly. People who are land rich but money poor. People who have been just trying to eke out a living for years, decades, and sometimes generations, who now are having people knock on their doors and say, we would like to give you thousands of dollars a month to lease your land. Now, if you're these people who are trying to eke out a living, are trying to be able to support a family and leave something to your family, can you blame people for wanting to take advantage of this? Can you honestly blame people? What, when people contact us and say, we've been approached by drillers and what do we do? I say, get your water tested. Get your water tested and make sure you have baseline studies. Make sure that you know if something does happen, and it always can, not because the natural gas industry is a bad industry and people are trying to do bad things, but because things happen. So protect yourselves if you are some of those people who, who have this opportunity. Now, these good things can happen. This can bring money to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which we need. We all know about the budget debacle that happened in Pennsylvania this year. We all know now that some state forest lands, however, are being leased to the industry. Good, bad, indifferent. Again, these are complex issues. And, but we have to work to make sure the people who are qualified to make the right decisions are making those decisions and are being consulted and we're not just working out of greed. Um, how, Tara, how much time do I have? I just want to... Six minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, right now we have about 690,000 acres of state forest lands that are available up for grabs for drilling. Just, I think it was last week or maybe a week before it was announced that a bunch of lands were leased, contracts were signed, auction was held, $128 million was signed in lease negotiations. The Pennsylvania budget said that $60 million had to, be, had to come from leases on Pennsylvania land. So now where's that other 62 or $68 million going? We're hoping it goes to DCNR. And the, the regulatory bodies and the organizations that will be impacted and need to do the work they kind of, they have to do to preserve our forests. And even if you're not big on trees and you like to live in the city, know that the tourism industry in Pennsylvania, that's it, that includes tourism, people who come for fall foliage tours, people who fish, people who hunt, bring in billions of dollars every year to this state's economy. That's money that goes right into the, the, the general fund, goes to other places, and if, that, and if we plow down our forests in, in, a, in a way that's not smart, then we are essentially affecting that, not only environment, but also that industry and that economy, that, that economic base. We have to be smart about it. There are other impacts from drilling. There are air quality issues. When wells are when wells are drilled, they have to be flared at some point. That gives off methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas. Methane in some places, some landfills recently, there was a project announced locally where methane is trapped and it's, and it's burned and it's used to produce electricity. There are things that can be done, but we have to watch out for all the side effects of things too, and we have to be aware of them. Uh, we, there is Federal legislation that is currently being looked at, Senator Casey is one of the, the people who proposed this bill. It's called the FRAC Act. And essentially, if the FRAC Act is, pa is passed, it would make it a law, a federal law, 
for all drillers to have to um, expose the chemicals they're using. We just saw up here, we have the list. DEP has a list of chemicals available on its website. You can link to it through the, from the Penn Future website. Um, but we don't have the concentrations there. There is federal legislation that Senator Casey is trying to help get through that we are supporting. And there is also, this would also change the Safe Drinking Water Act, which was uh, changed in 2005, 2006, um, where hydrofracturing was excluded from the Safe Drinking Water Act. We're trying to get that put back in. So there are things going on. Penn Future is very supportive of a severance tax. Chesapeake Energy, I hope you don't mind if I quote the CEO of Chesapeake, we quote all the time who has said, we gladly pay a severance tax in every state except New York and Pennsylvania. And, and you know, it's essentially we're giving a deal. As was mentioned earlier, we are close to the largest natural gas market in the United States, which is the northeast part of the United States. The transportation cost to get gas to market is a, is a large part of the cost of natural gas. When you drill in Pennsylvania, in some ways that cuts much of that transportation cost because you don't have to pipe it up from Texas or Oklahoma or Arkansas or other places where these fields are being developed. So the severance tax we would like to see passed would, would in fact put some money into the general fund of Pennsylvania, but it would also send money back to local municipalities that are being directly affected by drilling. For example, when you have all of a sudden this influx of workers, some long-term, some temporary workers who are skilled coming from other areas, now all of a sudden you have more people, but what about your police department? What about the fire department? What about the school systems? What about the housing that's affected? by all of a sudden, especially when you're in these rural areas where you don't necessarily have those kinds of services, well, who's going to pay to hire more, more people in a fire department, in a police department? This is where we want a chunk of this severance tax to go, to those local municipalities, to the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, to the Department of Environmental Protection, because as of January 2009, they only have 15 inspectors for 60,000 active wells. We need to do more. We need to stay in front of it. Again, I'm not saying the industry is a bad thing. In many ways, it could be a wonderful thing for Pennsylvania and for the nation. Thank you. But we have to be smart. We can't sacrifice our environment for the sake of money. Municipalities also have to plan ahead. If all of a sudden you have all this money coming into these municipalities, we say, whoa, we could do all sorts of things we never did before. Remember that sooner or later, a finite resource will run out. So I always caution municipalities, plan for that. Plan and put money aside into a fund that will help you when that resource runs out. Um, we're walking a tightrope. We're walking a tightrope, and we could go in either direction, and we could fall off one way or the other. What I encourage you and, and everyone who cares about this issue to do, contact your legislators. I have postcards with me that you could sign, and I'll take and, and deliver right to your legislators to let them know. Maybe this is okay. Maybe it's not okay. Maybe some of you don't want it at all. But if we're going to do it, please be smart <coughs> about it. Thank you for your time, and thank you for caring about Pennsylvania. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pam. And, and now we uncover a new facet, finding a balance between the economy and the environment, and using science and technology to mitigate any of the environmental impacts that could occur during operational phases of drilling. And then Pam also introduced another topic, fiscal policy and taxation. Not only implementing it, but then how are those resources used, and how can they be re reused to support the quality of life and the standard of living and reinvesting in our communities as we move forward. There's so much to talk about on this topic. Uh, at this point, I'd like to bring up Jennifer Means from the Department of Environmental Protection.
Hello, everyone. Um, sorry about the technical difficulty. I was running a little late this evening. I found out that my last eye doctor appointment must not have been very successful because I can't read street signs at night to save my life. So <laughs> running a little late, but anyway. Um, I'm with the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the program manager for the Eastern Oil and Gas Region, which is pretty newly formed within the last year. Um, this map kind of shows what our area is. Prior to last spring, the, uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania was split into two oil and gas regions, the northern region and the southern region. And both of those areas were handled out of two offices in the western part of the state, in Meadville and Pittsburgh. Um, about a year, year and a half ago, um, with all of the increase in Marcellus activity over in this eastern part of the state where we traditionally don't have a lot of drilling, um, there was an effort made you know, at, at high levels in the department and the governor's office to actually open a new office and hire 30-some new people to deal with this increase in Marcellus activity. Seventeen of those positions came to our office in the eastern region based out of Williamsport. Um, some of the other positions went to the, the northwest and southwest, southwest offices to deal with increased permitting activity. I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, our eastern region covers 45 counties. There's um, active drilling going on in about 22 counties, either new or the older shallow drilling activity. Six counties also have gas storage fields, which people don't think about a lot. Um, right now, we've actually increased staff. We originally were allotted those 17 positions. In the last couple of months, we've been given a few, uh, six more positions. We now have a total of 23. 20 of those are filled, and we're still trying to fill three of the vacancies. Um, for a little bit more history here, um, we started evolving into this program last February. I came into the oil and gas program. Uh, I've been with the department about 17 years in five different programs. Mostly over the last 10 years, I've been working in watershed-based programs, water quality programs, um, fo uh, focusing on watershed restoration efforts. And I guess I'd have to add on to our last speaker here. I also, I grew up in Schuylkill County in Pennsylvania, so grew up very much in the middle of um, the anthracite mining area, seeing the remnants of that activity um, all through my, you know, when I was growing up. And um, although I've worked in the watershed program for the last 10 years or so, sometimes working on abandoned mine drainage product projects and other uh, watershed type efforts. And then about a year and a half ago, got involved initially in the Marcellus activity through my work in the watershed program when we started looking at the water usage that was discussed. Um, and it kind of evolved from there. Um, I have my presentation set up to talk a little bit about the potential impacts between gas drilling and our water resources and some of the requirements we have in place to deal with those potential impacts and what our role is in the eastern region um, of Pennsylvania. So storm, you know, just highlighting them here, storm water, stream and wetland encroachments, the water use, drilling, fluids management, and wastewater disposal. And a lot of these have all already been described quite a bit, so I won't need to go into, into all of them in too much detail. Um, stormwater. I listed as construction and post-construction. Basically, when it rains, there's precipitation, water hits the ground and runs off, you have stormwater issues. During construction, when there's earth disturbance going on, they're out there moving earth to build these sites, you can have erosion and sedimentation occurring where the, the, you know, the soil is basically washed from the ground into streams or wetlands. Um, that sedimentation in the stream causes a potential impact to aquatic life. Also, um, stormwater conveyance facilities like culvert pipes and bridges can get clogged up so you have stormwater problems. In order to deal with that, what these operators are required to do is at the minimum have an erosion and sediment control plan or ENS plan on site and implement it. So those are uh, best management practices to keep that sediment from leaving the site and entering waters of the Commonwealth. Um, if they're disturbing five acres or more, they also actually need a permit from us, and that's called the ESCGP or Erosion Sediment Control General Permit 1. Um, so that's how we deal with that issue. And of course, our inspectors who go out on these sites are looking to see that those plans are there and are implemented. The post-construction stormwater runoff is as you increase impervious area anywhere, you know, whether it's in the city or, or from s development, sprawl, with pavement or um, 
you know, compacting the earth, then you can increase that just general stormwater runoff after the site has already been constructed. So, you know, when you're dealing with some of the smaller sites from uh, the drilling that we're used to in Pennsylvania, that might not be a very large impact. But when you're dealing with sites that are about five acres in size on average, then you're going to have more of that, especially if there are, there are a lot of them. And I worked a lot in the northern tier, um, north central Pennsylvania, and I know we were very subject to flashy, flo you know, storms, um, a lot of flash floods and that sort of thing. So that that's a concern, and we want to do what we can to prevent that. So as part of their um, permit, their erosion sediment control permit from us, they also need to address post-construction stormwater and explain how they're going to um, deal with those issues so there's not increased stormwater runoff. Stream and wetland encroachments. When they're building these sites, you need to cross streams and wetlands, usually with access roads, that sort of thing, to get up to where they're going to build the site. Um, occasionally, the well pad itself might be close to a wetland, but actually there's, there's a distance of 100 feet that they have to remain from any wetland or stream. So um, that should not be happening in most cases. But they will have to cross them sometimes. Also, when they're putting in these pipelines, the large gathering line projects, those cross streams and wetlands. So in order to mitigate any potential negative effect there, they do need to get a permit from the department for those activities. Um, we call them, uh, it's our Chapter 105 permit. There's general permits and, and joint permits, which are actually more uh, detailed and a lengthier review, depending on the amount of impacts they will have. Water use, I think that's already been touched on quite a bit from, from when I came in anyway. The hydraulic fracturing does use quite a bit of water. I'm going to say give or take five million. The, the industry folks may have had a better number on that. Um, so there's potential impacts of water withdrawals, um, you know, for, to surface and groundwater. So we require, the DEP requires a water management plan to be submitted by every operator for Marcellus Wells, where they need to explain to us where they're going to get their water and show us all the calculations that shows that it's not going to create a negative impact in that, in that water source. Um, if, in the Susquehanna River Basin, they always need um, SRBC approval prior to us being able to approve their water management plan. So we kind of do a bit of a joint review there. SRBC does a very thorough job on those reviews, and the same would go with the Delaware River Basin Commission. We're just starting to get involved with some activities with DRBC. Drilling itself. Um, I, I heard this mentioned also by with Pat, <laughs> previous speaker. Um, this is actually where there is a potential to have impacts to water supplies. Um, as she said, everybody's concerned about the, frac the, the fracking, hydraulic fracturing. Our experience so far has been, you know, I'm not going to say that's impossible, but that is uh, a lot less likely to cause an impact to somebody's water supply because that fracking is going on, again, you know, a mile or so under the ground, whereas most of your fresh water supply, those of you who are on private wells, might be, you know, in a, the first couple hundred feet. Um, maybe down to 600 feet or something like that. So there's a big distance and a lot of rock for that to go through. On the other hand, when you're actually drilling the well and you're going through that fresh water supply a couple hundred feet underground and the drill bit can actually come into contact with the water, that's where you have the opportunity to have some potential impacts to nearby water <coughs> supplies. A lot of times those are temporary and clear up, but we do investigate a lot of those types of complaints. And if there are impacts, then in most cases the, the well operator, if we can prove that or if they're within our presumed uh, liability distance, the, the operator would have to replace that water supply. Um, let's see. Yeah, our role in that is complaint investigations, inspections, and compliance and enforcement. Um, I mentioned earlier about the, the two regions in Meadville and Pittsburgh. At this point, since our office is, is very new, less than a year old, those two regions still actually issue the drilling permits themselves. So we're responsible in, in Williamsport in the eastern region for looking at a lot of the surface permitting activities like those ENS permits and the stream and wetland permits and also for all of the compliance and oversight. But those two offices still right now have the staff to deal with issuing the drilling permits. So they're evaluating some of those issues as they're reviewing those permits. Fluids management. This has become the thing that we actually spend probably most of our time on, and I don't think that we necessarily expected that um, going into this program. 
because I think of the, these larger sites and the amount of water it takes and then the amount of other chemicals it takes to drill and frack these wells, you've got a lot of things stored on site at different times and that creates a potential for spills. Um, yeah, as, as they said, when the fracking itself is occurring, this material is very dilute, so maybe not as much of an issue, but when it's being stored on site in different areas, you know, in, in concentrated form, then you have potential. So we've actually, it, you know, my staff personally spend a lot of time responding to spills that are reported and kind of following up on those, making sure that they're properly cleaned up. Uh, to be fair, most of the, I don't want to sound alarmist because there's only been a couple out of the many that have been reported that have actually reached a waterway or, or something like that. Most of them are on the well pad or pretty near the well pad are contained and are cleaned up. But it, takes, it still takes a lot of our staff time to follow through on that, you know, make sure that samples are collected to document that it's been cleaned up and that sort of thing. Make sure it's contained and there, there are no impacts getting off into surface waters or, or water, you know, nearby water supplies. Um, so that's where we spend actually a lot of our time. Uh, to address this, the companies are to have a PPC plan, Preparedness Prevention Contingency Plan, um, which, which addresses how they're going to deal with storage of these chemicals and what they will do in case of some sort of incident. And they are, they are required to notify us of spills, in which case you know, we follow up. We also get calls by complaints or sometimes find things when we're doing routine inspections. And there are certain standards that they have to clean up to when the spill does occur. Wastewater disposal, um, so this may have been touched on earlier too, the, the fracking itself, then some of that 20, 30 percent of that fluid comes back out of the hole, has to be disposed of. Um, if it's illegally or improperly disposed of, it could have potential impacts to surfing, surface and groundwater. Um, so they're, they're required to identify in their control and disposal part of their PPC plan where they're going to get rid of, of their um, frac flowback fluid and their other wastewater. Um, this is considered a residual waste, so it's managed according to those regulations. Our waste management program in the department primarily has the lead on uh, receiving these. They have to submit something called a Form U and a Form 26R um, to report on the disposal of those materials. And again, and as also touched on, uh, reuse is becoming something we're hearing more and more of, that a lot of companies are reusing this frack flow back from one well to the next, taking it to the next site and using it over again. And then they also don't need as much fresh water, so that's a good thing. Other issues that we're seeing, um, looking at, well, not that we're seeing, but at least potential things, gas migration cases um, that you folks may have heard of, there have not been as many of those in the, in the many of those in the time I've been with this program. Um, in the last year, two significant ones that I'm aware of in our eastern region. Um, situation in, in Dimmick, which many of you may have heard of, and also um, one in Lycoming County, where there was a gas leak at a well that was actually not a, a Marcellus well, but an Ariskany well um, in Lycoming County. So those have happened. They are, they do seem to be rare, which is a good thing, but um, also a bit scary. So I think any effort that we can take on the departments and to try and prevent those types of things from happening, certainly important. Um, other things, uh, you know, potential cumulative impacts of all this activity, uh, deforestation, stormwater impacts. When you're looking at all these well pad sites that we might have over the next 20 years, what will those total impacts be? And I don't know the answer to that. Those are things we just were kind of questioning and, and they're partially at least out of our, the realm of our regular regulatory purview. <coughs> there are some draft regulatory changes that the department is working on to address these four main issues. Protection and pre replacement of water supplies, new casing and cementing standards, uh, pressure testing, and stray <coughs> gas response. Finally, I am wrapping up here. Just to look at a comparison over the last three years for permits issued. This is across the state. Um, so you can see we went from 71 Marcellus permits uh, three years ago to almost 2,000 last year. In our eastern region, so there, there were 1,984 Marcellus permits issued in the last uh, year, 1,200 of those were in the eastern region. So we do have the brunt of Marcellus activity over here. 
challenges that we're facing, staffing, again, like I said, it, it's fantastic that we're getting more staff. Um, I'm optimistic that we may get more staff yet to continue to, to um, grow with this program. But it, it does take a while to get people on board to go through that hiring process and to get people up and trained. Um, so we're going through that. And um, just the volume and rate of activity. I think that this Marcellus activity is kind of taken off a lot faster than people anticipate it. And technology, just trying to um, have the technology, when you're talking about things like wastewater treatment, catch up in a way that is cost effective. That's it.